be the same. That's the outlet flow rate. We called it W. So that's the enthalpy of the outlet stream. So there's energy in minus energy out, right? This energy is flowing into the system. This is flowing out. And then we're adding the generation. We're adding energy through the Q, right? Because if you look back at the picture, there's some heating element. And it's transferring an amount Q. Q is a heating rate. BT is per hour, joules per second, something like that. OK. So in minus out plus generation. And now you have this accumulation term. So now you have to write what, what, how much energy is accumulating in the tank, OK? So first of all, that's going to be, you're going to take derivative respect to time. You want the term to have units like joules per second. That means the thing in here has to have units of energy, OK? Like joules or BTUs, OK? So first of all, what is the temperature of the material in the tank? It's the temperature T because it's well mixed, same as the outlet temperature. T minus T ref, right, since it's enthalpy, multiply times heat capacity. Now, what is the mass of fluid in the tank? Rho times V, OK? So if you take M, which is what Rho times V is, Cp delta T, that's the energy of the fluid in the tank. You take the derivative, that's the accumulation of energy in the tank, all right? So a necessary condition for this equation to make sense is every term has the same units, <laughs> right? So if you ever doubt whether your equation is right, the first thing you might want to do is make sure all the, all the equations have the same units, all the terms, right? This equation has four terms. They better all have the same units. And they actually better all have units of energy per time. I say it's necessary because you could still screw it up. You could still be wrong. But it can't be right if, if um, you have the wrong units. OK, so you got this equation. You have, sorry, got's not good English. You possess this fine equation, and now you seek to simplify it, and you do it as follows. First of all, you have W, I, and W are equal to each other, so you can just call this guy W right here, right? And then you have a W, C, P here. You have a W, C, P times this. The re two reference temperatures will cancel in those two terms. You see that? The, the final equation should not include the reference temperature, because otherwise this, the equation depends on the reference temperature. The reference temperature is arbitrary. So it should end up canceling out. So in this case, once you do the substitution of wi equals w, you'll see the two th terms involving t ref cancel, and you can gather the other two terms to look like that. Then you have the q there. And then I'm going to pull. So the, just looking at this derivative here, what well, we have d dt, and what is it? Rho v um, cp t minus t reference here. OK? I'd like to simplify that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rho and v and cp are all constant. So I can pull those all out of the derivative. You get this. Whoops, that's a dt. Nah, it's a bad one. Um, t minus t ref, OK? So obviously, this term here is d dt minus dt ref dt. But the, the reference temperature is a constant. It doesn't depend on time. So its derivative is 0. Right? So that's why you just end up with the term I have right here, which is t. Okay? So I pulled those terms out. I had the derivative of that term there. That yields just the derivative in time. Okay, and because I like to write differential equations with only derivative on the left hand side, I'll take this equation, I'll divide by rho v c p on both sides of the equation, and I'll get this. Okay? Just a standard way to write it. And so this is a differential equation for temperature, right? What do I want to do? I want to solve this differential equation to get temperature as a function of time, for example. Not for example, exactly. All right. To do that, I have to tell you what the temperature is at some value of time, usually time equals 0, right? So if you want to know where temperature is going, I have to tell you where temperature started. To solve this equation, I would have to give you everything else, right? I'd have to give you this flow rate, the heat capacity, the inlet temperature, the, the heating rate Q, the um, volume, the density, blah, 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 OK? This is, if you wrote this thing out, you would find this is, a li this is obviously a linear differential equation because the derivative and t appear linearly. It's obviously not homogeneous because the Q and the Ti terms here. So it would be a single, non-homogeneous linear differential equation. And I guess you could solve it using methods that you've learned in differential equations. We're not going to talk about that. All right? All right. 
So um, next example, and then maybe this will be the last example. We'll do the other ones later. So mixing tank. So we have two streams here. Okay? It's binary mixing. That means we have two components. We have component A and component B. All right? And so what I've written here is we have an, two inlet streams. And because PowerPoint is a pain in the butt, um, it looks like I'm mixing the two streams before the reactor, or before the tank, but actually they're both going into the tank and then being mixed. You know, it's just those auto-connect things. You, you ever been tortured by those? You draw it and it just automatically connects and you draw it here and it says, no, you don't. Okay. So anyway, so if I had my druthers and I, uh, I um, maybe it was a little more patient, you would see a picture where this comes in here, this one comes in here. They're, so you've got two streams. They each have different flow rates, mass flow rates. They each have different mass fractions. These could either be molar flow rates and mole fractions or mass flow rates and mass fractions. Let's just say it's all based on mass. So this is the mass fraction of one of the two components, right? Because you know that the sum of mass fractions has to equal one. So I'm just going to write out the, because it's binary, there's only two components. I'm only going to write it out with respect to one component. So W1 means the mass fraction of what other component I'm interested in, call it component A, in this stream. W2 is the mass fraction in this stream, and W3 is the mass fraction in that stream. Okay? So I'm taking two streams with two different flow rates and different mass fractions. I'm going to mix them together, and coming out, I'll get a new stream. It'll have some other flow rate and some other mass fraction. Okay? And so as you might imagine, the goal here is I'm going to tell you what goes in, and you tell me what comes out. That's how these problems work. It's not very usual I would tell you, what uh, tell you what comes out and ask you what came in. So I'm usually, okay? All right. And then we have some level of fluid here, right? Because this tank has some level associated with it. So if you look at this system, you say, boy, I bet I need a mass balance, an overall mass balance, and I bet I need a component balance. The, only, the reason we only worry about one component is because if you do an overall mass balance and then one component, that's all you need to do. You could, do no, you could just do both component balances and not the overall mass. But the third balance is redundant, so you only do, I hope you learned that it's somewhere. Okay. So we're going to do overall mass in one component. So here's the overall mass balance. Pretty simple based on what we said. Um, so here's the, two, here's the flow in. Right? There's two streams flowing in, W1 and W2. That's mass flow in. There's the mass flow out. That's going to equal the accumulation of mass in the tank. The mass of fluid in the tank is rho times V. Cylindrical tank, so V equals A times H. Okay? And if I substitute A times H right in there for V, then I can pull, pull a rho and an A out, divide by it, and you get a differential equation for the level. Okay? So, you know, you could write this equation either for the volume of fluid in the tank. People usually do it for the level. Because if you're in a plant, you usually actually measure the level. You don't measure the volume. So people tend to write the models in terms of level instead of volume. But obviously, they're, they only differ by A, the cross-sectional area. So there you go. Um, and so to do this, to, to solve this equation, right, in addition to knowing these flows, I would need to know, um, I would need to know the initial level. Okay? So there's the, there's the overall mass balance. Okay. So we, now we need a component balance. And so the component balance is a little trickier. So let's see how we do it. So first of all, you have to write the initial balance equation. So when you write out a model, the key thing is the initial balance equation, right? And then you might like screw it up manipulating it. Let's say it was a test and you made a mistake somewhere down here with the algebra. That'd be a lot less damning than not knowing how to conserve mass. You know what I'm saying? So the key step is the first equation here. So what are we saying here? So it's a component balance on whatever component or the mole fraction or mass fractions represent. So there's the amount of component A, let's say, in the, in the one stream plus the amount in the other stream. That's the total amount coming in. Again, you know, kilograms per second or whatever you want. And you're going to subtract the amount coming out because the amount coming out is this right here. Okay? That's going to equal the accumulation of component A in the tank. So to get that, you have to know the mass, total mass, right, which is that. And then you multiply that times the mass fraction, right? If you take the total mass times the mass fraction, that's the amount of A in the liquid in the tank. If you take the derivative, then that's the accumulation. Okay, looks good. Or looks not bad, at least. 
All right, so we aspire to get a differential equation just for x3, right? We want one equation for level, we want one equation for x3. And to do this, we're going to have to split this derivative up. Okay, you guys know the product rule? <laughs> Please? <laughs> Say you do. Sometimes lying is the best answer, by the way. But you and I know you guys know the product rule. All right, so we're going to use the product rule on this thing. And so we're going to do the following. I'm trying to see if I can do this thoughtfully or not. Actually, let me just pick this up next time because it's just going to take like another five to ten minutes. And then peop people are so used to getting out early, now they're getting a, light, a little agitated that maybe. So I'll pick up this example on Tuesday. And I will see you tomorrow for the exam.